Hello and welcome back to my channel. Um, I just have to get my chair back from the cat. Socks will lie on my reading chair all day long, given a choice, even though there are so many chairs and perching places around the house. Now he's in a huff. He's going to go to my chair in the corner, the other chair. Well, off you go. <laughs> um, I thought I would carry on with this business of trying to narrow down some titles for my exclusive and peculiar summer um, book club based on this channel. The socks is meant to be helping, but he's not. What I did in the last video was pick out a whole bunch of possibilities and read you little bits. And I think I'll do the same. And then I'll decide which are the ones I would like to reread and which are the ones I'm suggesting. It's also, by subterfuge almost, a way of introducing you to titles of books that I've loved in the past. It's not really subterfuge at all. This is June uh, 1997, and it's a novel by Laurie Graham, who I don't think I've talked about yet on this channel. She's one of my favourites. I've read almost everything by Laurie Graham. Um, this was a novel from the late 90s. Here's the blurb. It wasn't meant to be like this. Being on television was meant to lead to a rich social life, book signings, opening supermarkets, but for Lizzie Partridge, 40-something, divorced and TV cook on Midlands This Morning, it meant dinners for one, coping with an airhead for a daughter and following middle-aged men into corner shops. Her good friend Louis, if only he wasn't gay, thought he knew what the trouble was. Lizzie was always on the wrong side of the glass, looking in at other people's lives. Whatever the truth of that, things for Lizzie were going to get a lot worse before they got better. I think it's about taking, from what I remember, it's a kidnap scenario and it's set over Christmas, I think. Um, and I think the, <laughs> the, the TV cook and, the, um, and her friend hold the TV hosts of their morning show captive. I'm sure that's what that is, unless I dreamt it. It sounds like a kind of fever dream. Um, I will read a bit at random. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, at random. Yvonne's got a touch of jaundice. She was propped up in an O'Donnell nighty. Uh, so much for colour counselling. She said, he's doing everything wrong. He's done Sc Scott's football strip on white cottons and Cayley's jumpers. She's got nothing to wear and Scott's got a match on Saturday. Would you have time to take him? Could you take him after school? It's no use asking Phil. He don't know if he's coming or going on the checkbooks in my name. I could sign him a cheque for cash, but you know what he's like. He'll get the wrong thing. I dread to think what I'm coming back to. He mixes all the cloths up. Everything ends up. A floor cloth, tea towels, everything. I shall have to chuck them all out and start again. You have to depend on people for every mortal thing when you're in here. If you don't send me home soon, I shall have to walk out. They don't realise, these doctors. They've all got Swedish au pairs. They don't realise when you've got a family, you can't lie around slacking. My nets haven't even been done. I always wash my nets after New Year. Good old Yvonne. No watching the clock, wondering what to talk about next. When you visit her in hospital, just take a notepad and write down your orders. That's what she needs. Directing ops from Ward G5. I felt weird after I left her. I'd never seen her in bed before, and it didn't seem right. Even when she'd had Cayley and Scott, she was up and about straight after, wiping disinfectant over everything, waking them up for their next feed so they didn't mess up the timetable and put her behind with ironing. I went down to the coffee shop and bought a cup of tea. I thought I'd just sit for a while, think things over and write down what I had to do before I forgot. Um, what she does, <coughs> I think, Laurie Graham, so well is ventriloquise people. And it can be all kinds of people. And latterly in her career, she was, uh, she's been writing historical fiction going back into the 19th and 18th centuries. And she still has the same knack, a bit like Beryl Bainbridge, actually. Uh, that's the closest relation in a kind of writery, writerly sense that I can think of. Um, even when characters are far afield in history or geographically, she can still catch their voices in that kind of detail. 
as when they're kind of more close to and contemporary. I think she's a, a great writer, Laurie Gray. Uh, this is a book called Reads Like a Novel, Daniel Pennack. It was a French book, I think. I think he's French. Um, it's a non-fiction book about reading that I read quite some time ago. Let's look at the date. 94, it says, but I think, I think it was later than that that I read it. Um, the back blurb has this. The reader's rights. One, the right not to read. Two, the right to skip pages. Three, the right not to finish a book. Four, the right to reread. Five, the right to read anything. Six, the right to Bovary's me, a textually transmissible, transmissible disease. Um, from, I guess, Flaubert's statement that Madame Bovary, c'est moi, that he became his characters. So he's talking here about the right to uh, identify completely with the characters you're reading about. Seven, the right to read anywhere. Eight, the right to browse. Nine, the right to read out loud. And ten, the right to remain silent. Let's dip in. <clears throat> uh, chapter 35. If reading is not an activity involving immediate communication, it is, however, in the final instance, a form of sharing. But the sharing is greatly deferred and fiercely selective. If we were to compare the great books we owe to school, to criticism or to all forms of publicity, with those we owe to a friend, a lover, a classmate or even to the family, so long as its members didn't lump books together with education, the result would be clear. The greatest things we've read are usually owed to someone dear to us. And it's to someone dear to us that we'll speak of them first, perhaps because sentiment by its nature, like the desire to read, consists in preferring. To love in the end means to make a gift of our preferences to those whom we prefer. And by such selective sharing is the invisible citadel of our freedom populated, where inhabited by books and by friends. When someone dear to us gives us a book to read, it's this person we initially search for in the lines, the tastes, the reasons, the signs of kinship, which prompted the person to thrust this book at us. After that, we're carried away by the text, and we forget the one who launched us into it. There precisely lies the ultimate power of a work, in its ability to sweep away that contingency as well. As the years go by, however, it seems that the mention of the work brings back the memory of the person. Certain titles in this way turn back into faces. And to be absolutely fair, it's not always the face of a loved one, but someone's, oh, seldom that of a critic or teacher. Um, I recall the, the look of Pierre Duhamet, Duhamet, for example, his voice, his silences on lectures pour tout during my childhood. They exemplified his great respect for the reader, who, thanks to him, I was going to become, or that teacher whose passion for books was such as to endow him with all necessary patience, and even to give us the illusion of love. He must surely have had a preference, or esteem at least for us, his pupils, to have made into a gift of reading what was dearest to him. That's very odd to launch into the middle of that and find a chapter that's so relevant to the idea of our small, select, obscure, obtuse and perverse book club. How funny. The idea of a reading list, a reading suggestion as a um, gift, uh, as opposed to being handed books for the sake of education or criticism or hype or publicity. That's really interesting to get into that. It is a gift, I think, and that's what I'm trying to hone. I want to reread all of that, I think. Right, now a very peculiar novel, uh, The Queen of the Tambourine by Jane Garden, which I don't know when I read this, in the 90s, I guess, and it was a suggestion of a few different friends. Um, this was back in 1991 it first came out. It's an epistolary novel, I think. It's all in letters um, and does that thing very well of um, what epistolary novels do in getting the reader to gauge how far from reality 
the writers of these letters have strayed? How much are they exaggerating? How much can their versions of reality be relied upon? I'll read the beginning. 7th of February. Dear Joan, I do hope you know... I do, I do hope I know you you well enough to say that... I'm sorry about that. I've <laughs> messed that up. Dear Joan, I do hope I know you well enough to say this. I think you ought to try to forget about your leg. I believe that it's something psychological, psychosomatic, and it's very hard on Charles. It's bringing both him and you into ridicule and spoiling your lives. Do make a big try, won't you? Forget about your bodily aches and pains. Life is a wonderful thing, Joan. I have discovered this great fact in my work with the dying. Your sincere friend, Eliza Peabody. February the 17th. Dear Joan, I wrote you a quick little note last week and wonder if it went astray. I know that you and I have not known each other for very long and have been neighbours for a very few years, but somehow I feel I know you closely. Perhaps it's because we first met in church. I remember the sudden appearance of this new, yet somehow rather familiar woman sitting in the side aisle. Your glassy, slightly hostile look. You seemed suddenly to have materialised there by some accident of the light. I remember that you did not kneel or bow your head, and when you were asked at the church door whether you would like to join something or do the flowers, a look came into your eyes, and I have never seen you in church again. In my note, I perhaps presumed on a friendship that was not quite as strong as I had imagined and spoke perhaps peremptorily about your leg. Please forgive me if I had said too much, but I do hate to see Charles looking so low, a man whose wife has an undiagnosable leg at scarcely 50 feet, at scarcely 50, is liable to be a figure of fun. Why not come over and see me? I'm busy with marmalade and have found a clever ruse for dealing with the pith that might interest you. It makes the marmalade wonderfully translucent. Your sincere friend, Eliza. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is something I want to go back to. As I remember, it got crazier and crazier as it went on. The writing on the back is so small, it makes me want to um, scream. But there in, there's no blurb there. It's just quotes about how marvellous it is. And as I remember, it was marvellous. How far have we got? 12 minutes. I'll carry on for a bit. I don't want to make these videos too long. They tend to be about 20 minutes. They were encroaching, though. They were going up. And I wonder if people are watching to the end or if um, I'm going on a bit much. This is a collection of stories by Delmore Schwartz. In Dreams Begin Responsibilities and Other Stories. It was suggested to me years ago by Georgina Hammack, who I was talking about yesterday. These are stories from, I think, uh, yeah, 48, 61. It's kind of mid-century. Um, what does it say about him? This collects eight of Schwartz's finest delineations of New York intellectuals in the 1930s and 40s. As no writer, he captures speech, the generational conflicts, the mocking self-analysis self of educated, ambitious, depression-stymied young people at odds with their immigrant parents. Right, I'm going to dip in. Delia was attractive and intelligent. She was unable to understand why no amorous interludes occurred, for certainly Oliver was not in the, in the least at a loss when she heard everywhere of extramarital episodes of other human beings. She did not understand that it was not a question of a defect in her, but of the difficulty of direct communication in modern life, the difficulty of making clear her willingness. At times she entertained this explanation, but the passing recognition was ineffectual and melted away because more powerful by far was her fear that she was not attractive. By attributing her poverty and love to an unattractiveness which did not exist, she arrived at a picture of her plight which was coherent and which required no activity on her part, but merely sorrow. This view permitted her an, un an uneasy acquiescence in continuous unhappiness. And now the party had become an entity and an event like a snowfall in a metropolitan city. Everyone had had enough to drink, just enough to make them amiable. Everyone shone. The charms of each human being sparkled like theatre marquees. The conversation seemed, in the warm subjectivity of choice spirits, to be as brilliant as Mozart 
In some ways, the exchanges resembled a ballroom dance. In other words, in other ways, they were like the moment when the silent and ever wondrous snow has overcome the great city and made a new thing of it, full of innocence, freshness, and the unexpe unexpected marvels of whiteness. The stories which were told were not lacking in malice, but the malice was gentle. It was apologised for, and it was introduced only because, as everyone knows, it's very difficult to be funny without attacking some other human being for whom one has, as a whole, some admiration and affection. Lovely. Yep, that is somebody I want to go back to. Now, in the summer of 1998, I read Whiston and Chester, a memoir by Tecla Clark, who uh, is an actress who spent some of her youth with um, W. H. Auden and his boyfriend, uh, is it Chester Coleman? That was it. And they went all over the world together and had adventures of all kinds. Uh, during the 1950s, W. H. Auden and Chester Coleman spent their summers on Ischia, on or was it Ischia, on the Gulf of Naples, which for a time looked a little like paradise. As an American in her 20s, Tecla Clark got to know her friends, the friends very well indeed, on their island retreat and remained close to them for the rest of their lives. Her recollections of um, are first-hand fresh and amusing. And she gives an intimate account of the two men unlike any other of the period. Honestly, Faber, make everything sound fusty <laughs> and boring. They've always done it. I don't know why. They just do. I think because they're so serious and intent on their own importance that they, um, they just make everything feel like it's been pulled out the back of the wardrobe smelling of mothballs. And of course, what he's talking about is an actress gadding about on the continent with two old queer, two young queers in the kind of prime of life and when he's producing his best poetry. Anyway, dipping in. That winter, 1957, was a difficult time for Whiston. He had tried staying in Ischia all year round without Chester. He came to Florence twice and made as many other trips as possible, but he was still terribly lonely. He was also bound up in his theories about male menopause. He was cross with me because I couldn't enlighten him about hot flashes. And I, being 30, was cross with him for asking. It was the only time I heard him express any doubts about his work. Not a single piece, but the whole thing. I'm a clown, he said. And when I answered, a sacred one, I couldn't think of anything else to say. He said, no, but a transatlantic one at least. We went for long walks and both agreed that it was loneliness, a rainy winter and that wonderful excuse, male menopause. On one of our walks, Whiston said to me, you women are so fortunate, you know. You know why you're here. I'm adrift. I tried to be a comforter and suggested that these moments were only temporary. You Americans, he said, to you time implies hope. The conversation was going nowhere. I had no answer and Whiston had no intention of continuing. We walked along in a rare silence until we came to a bend in the road. There was Harvard, Whiston's name for a village idiot, leaning on the rock, leaning on a rock, looking out to sea and masturbating. We went home and had a drink, 20 minutes ahead of schedule. That's definitely worth a reread, I think. Um, I'm going to stop there. That's another five I've gone through to, um, to try and decide on some, um, some books for this book club. I think out of these, I would pick up the... Um, I'd want to reread all of them at some point, but Daniel Pennock and I think Jane Gardham are my choices from that particular stash of books. Anyway, that's enough uh, for this session. <laughs> I will um, see you again soon. Do like and subscribe and let me know what you prefer from the things that I've been reading out, if anything. 
uh, or whether you'd rather be doing somebody else's book club in which they choose uh, new and uh, more exciting books, perhaps. Anyway, goodbye, and I'll um, see you again soon.